Okay, well, um, thank you very much. Thanks to Tracy for all of her efforts in putting this conference together. And as she said, having co-founded the original Data Power Conference in Sheffield two years ago, you know, that makes me especially delighted to be here to kick off Data Power 2.0 and to make some opening statements to launch us into what I'm sure is going to be two stimulating days. I'm just going to move slightly to the right. Okay. Um, so, I also, as Tracy said, I had the pleasure of working with Joe Bates and Isabel Gerard on Data Power 1.0, but also with a bunch of less visible workers without whom the whole infrastructure to run conferences would not exist, so they also need um, some acknowledgement. Since then, with Joe, uh, I've co-edited a special issue of the journal Television and New Media, which comes out of that first Data Power conference. And it focuses on data power in material contexts. And the final elements are coming together right, right now, so it should all be available online and uh, offline as well really very soon. So in the introduction uh, to that special issue, Joe and I note that critical scholarship on data power has come a long way in a short time, providing us with detailed analysis of the costs of what Lisbeth Van Zunen, where's my clicker? There we go. Um, calls the data delirium, and the cost of the kinds of power that are enacted when data are employed by governments, security agencies, private corporations, and all kinds of other actors. So through this scholarship that has established these costs for us, we know a few things. We know, for example, that datification leads to less privacy and more pervasive, speculative, and opaque surveillance. We think here maybe of the work of Mark Andreevich, Kelly Gates, Jose Van Dijk, Helen Nissenbaum, and others. We know also that algorithms play important roles in the emergent forms of datafied governance and control that we're witnessing, they certify knowledge, they shape public, social, and cultural life. And here we might think of the work of Tolton Gillespie, Kate Others, or before them, the earlier work of Scott Lash. We also know that their major troubling consequence of datification is that it re reproduces old inequalities and creates new ones. Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford have been important in noting the dif that differential access to data, how they're constituted and used, are, quote, inequalities written into the system. But so too other scholars researching the discriminatory consequences of the rise of big data have highlighted the ways in which datification affects communities differentially. We might think here of the work of Virginia Eubanks and Sita Pena Gagandaran, their project Our, Our Data Bodies, shown here, which explores how data-driven discrimination can mean that already disadvantaged populations have their access to fundamental human rights even further limited. So this research, this critical research that's come a long way in a short time, has played a vital role in making visible the serious issues that datification raises in relation to rights, freedoms, and justice, and in questioning the celebratory rhetoric that has accompanied the spread of big data, not only in computer science and commercial sectors, but in our own fields of social sciences and humanities as well where enthusiasm about data's potential for contributing to social knowledge can be found. So, while research in this vein continues to be important, please be clear that that's what I'm saying, I'm also going to suggest a couple of ways in which we might move the agenda on as we look forward to future research into data power. And I'm going to make two interlinked points here. So, the first point... Because our field, which we might call data studies, let's call it data studies, everybody, um, has primarily focused on the operations of data power from above, it's been characterized in large part by a focus on powerful actors. Recent studies which turn attention to efforts to democratize data, such as 
open data initiatives, hackathons, the quantified self movement, or data activism also often focus on elites as the initiatives and practice, practices that are the focus of these studies tend to involve technological and data savvy experts. So as a consequence, data studies hasn't paid much attention to ordinary everyday experiences of living with power. So my point here is that the voices uh, of the people who data power is said to affect are largely missing from our conversations. Mike Michael and Deborah Lupton noted in 2015 that there is still little research that has investigated what the public make of big data, aside from reports from privacy organizations and government bodies. And I would say that characterization still largely holds true two years later. And it's because of this absence that alongside Michael and Lupton, eminent commentators like Nick Coldry and Alison Powell, who walked in the room a few minutes ago, Sarah Pink and others at the Data Ethnographies Lab in Australia, have called for more research into everyday engagements with data, or researching data power, quote, from the bottom up, end quote, to use Coldry and Powell's terms. <clears throat> so what's more... A lot of the important critical research that's been carried out to date has operated at a general and theoretical level. As new data practices become embedded across a growing range of social realms, more detailed empirical studies are needed that ground the study of data power in specific material contexts and focus attention on the important issue of how data power is experienced at the level of the everyday. And I would say that stu such studies are beginning to emerge. A handful are collected together in the special issue of the journal that I mentioned that emerged from the first data power conference. For example, Taylor and Richter's paper about the datification of water supplies in Bangalore. And to be honest, such studies are the reason that I finally decided that I would get on a plane and travel to a different time zone for this conference. I was involved in its organisation, but I travelled too much, my children would tell you. And it was only when I saw the abstracts for this paper and I saw that such studies were promised here that I thought, yes, I'm definitely going to come along to that. So <clears throat> the field needs and is beginning to get, I'm suggesting, more research into everyday experiences of data power in material contexts and from the bottom up. Focusing on everyday experience of data power, on how and where power operates within ordinary cultures, shines a spotlight on the non-powerful status of many people in relation to datification. It also makes visible the fact that society including data power and datification, is not constituted solely through the structures that have been the focus of much of the research in our field to date. Rather, such structures are experienced and called into question, or made and unmade, to use Sarah Neal and Karen Murgy's terms, at the level of the everyday. Of course, everyday experiences are not all the same, and thinking about how people experience data power will help us take account of how social inequalities lead to different data experiences and how data affects citizens differentially, as a number of scholars have argued that we must. Okay, so moving on to my second related point here, which looks at emotions, ethics, and better living with data. So exploring how ordinary people experience data power in their everyday lives should give us access to their perspectives on how they might live better with data and with data power. This idea of living better or living well with data doesn't mean trying to find ways of encouraging people to accept existing and oppressive data, relation, data arrangements, right? It doesn't mean that. None of us want that. Rather, it means exploring how data arrangements could be improved from the perspective of the people that they are said to affect, as critical commentary on data harms suggests they need to be. So... Here, I turn to this book by Andrew Sayer, 
Why Things Matter to People. He's a British political theorist and philosopher and a little bit controversial within his own social science circles. Because he talks about the importance of this concept of living well within the social sciences. And he sets out why ideas about living well are vital to understanding how greater social justice might be achieved. So our interest, I think our shared interest in data justice for him uh, means that we need to think about notions of living well. He argues that social researchers need to be more attentive to people's first-person evaluative relation to the world, to their evaluations of how they live and how they might live well. And he argues that within the social sciences, social researchers often disregard people's evaluative relation to the world and the force of these evaluations, whereas he claims that values, feelings and emotions need to be taken seriously. He writes that there is a macho tendency to view the study of values, emotions and ethics as less scientific than the study of power, discourse and social structure, which is one of my all-time favourite clever quotes because it's got the word macho in it. Um, and it captures exactly, I think, what the problem is here that he is concerned about and I am also addressing here. So he argues that we need to develop an understanding of what he describes as, quote, ethical being in everyday life, end quote, in order to better understand how power operates and how justice might be achieved. So there's a direct link between these perhaps unusual concepts of living well and justice and the operations of power. And by the way, Sayer rightly acknowledges the feminist origins of the politics that he's de he describes, a politics of ethics, emotions, and everyday life. So listening to what people themselves say would enable them to live well with data is one way of, of doing the kinds of things that I'm saying uh, we need to do in our field. And so I'm just going to talk um, for a couple of minutes of, about a couple of my own research projects as a way of kind of illuminating um, this process and also to show how I came to understand the important role that emotions play in everyday experiences of living with data and with data power. So I'll talk, I'll sum up five years research in four minutes. Um, okay, so in research into social media data mining in what I call ordinary organisations, the pillars of everyday life like local councils, museums, training organisations, educational institutions, shops, um, one thing that emerged across research sites was what I describe as a desire for numbers, which I've, I've argued in this book here, engaging in data mining elicits. In research with city councils and museums, data generated through experiments with social media data mining techniques was met with much enthusiasm by participants, especially when presented in visually appealing charts and graphs. So this book brings together a, a bunch of different research projects. That was one of them. Another involved interviews in social media analytics companies where some social media analysts said that accuracy was not important to their clients. Clients are drawn in by the allure of numbers and just want numbers, participants said. And inaccuracy is acceptable as long as the desire for numbers is met. Uh, in interviews in organisations which use the services of these social media analytics companies, one digital marketer expressed his frustration at what he described as the fetishism of the 1,000, or the perception that the ability to cite numbers of people reached through a campaign is proof in itself of a campaign success. So while these emotions might be somewhat troubling, on another research project which looked at people's engagements with data visualisation, we found a more diverse range of emotions and we found that they um, played more productive roles um, some of the time. 
Because a major way that most people access data is through their visualization, visual sensibilities are often required to make sense of data. And so what I argue with my co-researchers on this project is that this entanglement of the numeric and the visual at the heart of most people's engagements with data in their everyday lives means that data stir up emotions. And here I'm showing a completely random uh, sample of a bunch of data visualizations just to get you in the mood. Okay, so um, now I'm going to focus on... Uh, in one particular example, this is a visualization um, of the ways in which the British press describes migrant groups. And I'm sure you, well, let me uh, get you to guess. What word do you think most frequently precedes the word migrant in the British press? Illegal, Illegal yes, correct. So uh, you can imagine what the visualization was um, communicating. The visualization prompted two participants to imagine the experiences of those migrating to the UK and encountering negative media portrayals of migrants and to feel strongly about this imagined experience, describing the feelings that the visualization evoked as feeling guilty for being British or feeling ashamed of the media as a whole. And here I think we can see this connection between emotions and ethics um, in the evaluation um, of data that Sayer draws our attention to. And in an article that I wrote with Rosie Hill, we argue that although these two participants drew on what they already knew about the causes of migration and asylum seeking, it was the visualization that provoked these strong feelings of sorrow, shame, and guilt. It translated data back into people for these two participants. It diminished the distance that data is said to evoke and made it possible to experience um, data emotionally. So for these reasons, I'm, I'm an advocate of attending to the important role of visual representations of data. I see this as um, a political project, not an apolitical semiotic project, but in the spirit of social semiotics, which looks at the political and social structures that generate um, particular texts or conventions and so on. And this is a project that I'm continuing to work on, exploring uh, data visualization in these ways. And I'm showing you it because they paid for me to come here. <laughs> OK, so uh, like, like focusing on the visual and visual representations of data, focusing on the emotional dimensions of living with data is also relevant to the mission of researching data power, although I realize that this might not uh, seem evident at first sight. But what I want to argue is that there's a relationship between the feelings that engaging with data stirs up and the serious issue of inequality in times of datafication. Okay, so we've established that datafication is everywhere. Some groups are affected um, uh, differentially. Some new inequalities emerge. And some of these are about the ability to engage with and make sense of uh, data. As long as some groups can't do this, we will continue to experience these inequalities. But if we start to acknowledge the role of emotions in engaging with data, this might change. Feelings offer a way into making sense of data and datification processes. Building on this idea, for example, in initiatives which aim to enhance data literacy, like the School of Data shown here, might result in more people feeling confident about their skills for engaging with data, and greater understanding of datification might follow. So again, my point here is, let's take the emotional dimensions of engaging with data seriously. Attending to the links between data and emotions might help us out of other contemporary conundrums too. News stories questioning whether people want facts and data have led to the assertion that we're living in a time of post-truth politics in which facts and data are increasingly devalued. In post-truth times, it would seem people do not desire numbers. But a problem with this debate, I would say, is that emotions and data are seen as separate. 
whereas I'm proposing that they're not. They're intricately interwoven in people's experiences of datification and everyday life. And understanding this might help us identify ways out of this current post-truth craziness. So as we proceed over the next two days, as we talk about agency, activism, truth, ethics, representation, justice, inequalities, and power, these are some things that we might want to think about. Thank you.